Hello and welcome to News Central TV. I am Adebola Adeduba. The headlines. Nigeria's president, Tinubu to attend burial of slain soldiers in Delta State. Jacob Zuma's party supporters celebrate as court rules it can contest South Africa elections. Kenyan authorities begin handover of victims to families of court massacre. Details shortly. The news begins in West Africa, where the burial ceremony of 18 army personnel killed in Okwama community, a Delta State, Southern Nigeria, has been scheduled for Wednesday. Army spokesperson Major General Onye Maonwachuko announced this in a statement on Tuesday. He said President Bola Chinubu would be the special guest of honor at the event. According to Onwachuko, the remains of the personnel would be laid to rest at about 3 p.m. at the National Cemetery in Abuja. Meanwhile, some leaders of the Niger Delta have pleaded with President Bola Chinubu to allow the people of Okwama in Ugeli South local government area, Delta State, who fled their homes about 12 days ago following the siege to the community by the Nigerian army over the killing of 17 soldiers to return home and pick the pieces of their lives. The Nigerian Security and Civil Defense Corps has uncovered a massive illegal oil bunkering site at Odagwa community in Eche, local government area of River State. Parading the suspect, spokesperson of Rivers Command, Superintendent Olufemi Ayodele, hinted that a successful discovery of over 10 illegal refineries with an estimated 500,000 liters of crude oil contained in about 50 illegally constructed reservoirs was based on credible intelligence. While conducting an operational tour across the large forest, about 10 different cooking pots of 50,000 liters capacity were discovered with unqualified liters of crude oil and illegally refined automotive gas oil stored in six very large reservoirs and other smaller reservoirs. The Commandant General Special Intelligence Court has made these arrests. All the suspects would definitely be charged to court of competent jurisdiction. Investigation is still ongoing because if you look at the nature of this illegal operation taking place in this vicinity, you will know there is a cartel involved. By the time we start our investigation, a thorough investigation indeed, we will unravel the mystery behind this unscrupulous and nefarious activity. The NSCDC will not relent. We will continue to fight the cause of ensuring that every activity or every act that constitutes sabotage to the economy of this nation is taken very seriously. And every suspect or culprit that are arrested will be brought to book. We will confiscate all the materials that are being used for these illegal oil banking activities. After we have confiscated it, then we're going to shut this environment down and ensure that no activity takes place here again. Governor Uba Sani of Kaduna State has received the abducted school children from Kurega after 16 days of being in captivity. The general officer commanding one division of the Nigerian army while handing over the rescued children to the governor at the state government house in Kaduna, says 137 children were rescued, but 131 was physically present, while the remaining six were still undergoing medical care at a military facility in the state. Mavala Sabamano was at the government house in Kaduna and now reports. It was almost termed a rumor or mere speculation when the military announced the rescue of the 138 kidnapped school children in Kuriga, located in Chikum local government area of Kaduna State. Parents and stakeholders concerned waited anxiously for the arrival. They are here present this afternoon and also at one division medical services and hospital. A total of 137 students 
of the government's secondary and local education authority primary schools, Kuriga, in Chukun local government area of Kaduna State. Today, to the glory of God, all the children abducted are here back safely. The general officer commanding one division, Nigerian Army, Kaduna, accompanied by other military and paramilitary agencies in the state, arrived with the rescued victims, revealing that both kinetic and non-kinetic approaches were adopted in the rescue operation. Meanwhile, the governor of the state criticized those, asking for the specifics of the rescue operation, saying they should be contended with the rescue of the children and their safe return back to their families. The abducted Kuriga school children have over in the early hours of yesterday, Sunday, 24th March 2020, safely rescued after spending about 16 days in captivity. The students were initially received and administered first aid at the Nigerian Army Troops Forward Operating Base at Tansadao Forest in Zampara State. I want to also caution our insecurity merchants and complete merchants in Nigeria to be cautious with our transits. Since the return of my children in the last few two days or oh, yesterday evening when I was able to visit them, a lot of people have been spending a lot of time coming with permutations on how these children were released, what happened, for us in Kaduna, what is more important is the several returns of our children. We're happy they're here with us. That is more important. During the handover ceremony, we observed that no parent was on ground to receive their words, and no information was given for this. In Kaduna for News Central, I am Marvelous Oboman. Still on security matters, Nigeria has been marred with insecurity in the last few years leading to the death of thousands of people and displacement of many in different regions of the country. During the gathering of reporters attending the launch of the book, Anything and Everything Journalism, the role of the media in surveillance and sensitization was emphasized as a key tool to help tackle insecurity issues. New Central's Bettina Unwili has details. The media has been accused of contributing to the worsening state of insecurity and conflict in Nigeria, due to their pattern of reportage, which primarily aims at maximizing profit by manipulating the audience. More worrisome is the fact that insurgents mainly seek first and foremost to manipulate and explore the media for their own selfish purposes by sending out messages that will increase their publicity. Something that should inspire journalists uh, to be more focused on their passion, to be more critical, about the elements, um, the finesse that goes into, into their craft. And I think much more importantly to be able to build um, a new, what I'll call a new crop of journalists um, that will build a sustainable future for the profession. Even in the developed world, even in England, in America, if anything happens, even to the president, you can see that the um, Princess of Wales, she had cancer and it was announced. The Prince of Wales, the king, you see, the point is that we must always allow people to be informed. If you don't give information to Nigerians, then you are forced to allow them to start carrying unnecessary rumors. Speaking on the spate of kidnap and insecurities in the country, Dakoku Peterside had this to say about the role of the media. If media practitioners are professionally trained and are thoroughbred professionals, nothing, nothing can come as a barrier between them and doing their duty. Even in the United States, it is not government that will give media access. Media will have access one way or the other. And now, particularly to the insecurity going on in our country, there ought to be some form of collaboration between security personnel and journalists or the media. Now, who fosters this collaboration? It could be either the military or the media. What matters, most importantly, is the fact that if people understand the critical role the media can play in addressing insecurity, the media will obviously offer you the platform. About policy, about delivering good services, isn't it? 
Journalism, as an industry, faces a lot of challenges in Nigeria, but as long as the government and media fail to mitigate terrorist exploitation of the new media, things may persist. Analysts say the media should deliberately work to improve upon its performance criteria so as to restore confidence in the hearts of the people. In Lagos, for News Central, Bettina Nguyen. Um, you're watching News Central now. Let's take a short break. Stay with us. Thank you for staying tuned. The leadership of the Labour Party said it won't rescind the decision to hold its contentious national convention on Wednesday as planned. Development comes two days after the party formally petitioned relevant government institutions requesting an urgent intervention to protect the party against further aggression from the Nigeria Labour Congress. In the four separate letters written to the Secretary of the Government of the Federation, George Akome, Attorney General of the Federation, Latif Fagwemi, Ministry of Labour and Employment and Registrar of Trade Unions, Faloni Kme Amos. The party also called for disciplinary action to be taken against the NLC president, Joe Ajero, and other union leaders who spearheaded the alleged vandalization of its properties. One of the frontline governorship aspirants of the All Progressives Congress, APC in Ondo State, Paul Akintalure, is late. The spokesperson of the APC in Ondo State, Alex Kalejaye, confirmed the incident on Tuesday. While the cause of his death is still unknown, Akintalure's demise came days after the medical doctor turned political politician raised alarm about threats to his life. The late Akintalure had in 2012 run as the deputy governorship candidate of the Action Congress of Nigeria, ACN, with Oluwaro Timi Akere Dolu. Before then, he contested for the Ondo South Territorial election under the ACN. He was a Lagos-based private medical practitioner who hailed from Igbo Tako in Okitipupa, local government area of Ondo State. The Minister of the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja, Yesom Wike, has delivered a scathing rebuke to those he termed as political harlots in River State. Minister Yesom Wike means no words as he addressed attendees at a Thanksgiving event hosted by the minority leader of the House of Representatives, Kingsley Chinda. Wike in his address vowed to persistently outmaneuver those opposing him politically. The minister reminisced about the pressures he faced in 2023 regarding the selection of his successor noting that Kingsley Chinda would have been a formidable choice. He urged the people of River State to continue supporting the legislative arm, emphasizing the importance of maintaining its independence. Pressure came on me. Pressure came at the time we wanted who would succeed me. Pressure came. One of the very best I would have presented would have been Oke Chinda. One of the very best. Don't forget people going from one place to the other. They are forming this. They are allowed. Don't dissipate your energy. Don't worry yourself. The time will come. We will say, who knows the game? You play the game. Leave these political harlots. Leave these political challenges. I will continue to defeat them. It is not about Wiki has this, Wiki has that. You have your own. I, I don't have impunity. Nigeria's federal government says it is set to conduct a comprehensive census of the nation's education sector to help plan properly for its growth. Nigeria's Minister of Education made this known during a two-day capacity building training for desk officers of the ministry, including each department's agencies and tertiary institutions, saying that the current challenges affecting the sector will require proper data for planning. The role that education plays in the national development of a nation cannot be overemphasized. However, with poor educational infrastructure, inadequate classrooms, 
and teaching it among other challenges. Not enough data is available for effective planning to improve the nation's educational sector. And the engaging and working together with our IT people to generate data on schools, all schools in Nigeria. If you saw the background of the Kuriga school, you would want to cry. It's not a very good sight to see. Now, that data will help us advise the state governors who are in charge of those schools, the conditions of those schools, so that they can move in and do the right thing. The data on teachers will help us know teachers to the ratio in every state, every local government, in every school. While the minister also expressed concerns over poor teaching methods affecting students' ability to assimilate at the pre-tertiary level of education, development partners present pledged to support efforts aimed at tackling this challenge by bridging funding gaps. There's a report that just came out by the uh, EPRD about students or people's at levels two and three, finding it difficult even to identify numbers and letters. But how can we come in? We can only come in when we have the necessary data. Because zones could differ, states could differ, schools could even differ. Our, our strategy is to make sure that the fi uh, international financing, the technical assistance, the best practice from around, around the world is available. This capacity building training workshop focused on implementation, collation, harmonization and reporting of ministerial deliverables. The minister tasked participants to collaborate and help restore the glory of the nation's educational sector. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. Nigeria's Minister of Foreign Affairs has called for the skilled negotiators needed to help Nigeria negotiate far-reaching international agreement that will be beneficial to the nation. And this was during the formal investiture and inauguration of the Academy of International Affairs in Abuja, a think tank comprised of Nigerians with relevant and far-reaching international and diplomatic experience. Amadine Ui has details. With a high rate of inequality and poverty on the African continent, despite its abundant natural and human resources, many believe Africa continues to punch below its capacity. Experts say Africa's challenges are numerous, from inequality to insecurity, which continues to place a heavy burden on citizens. Africa now accounts for 39% of the global poor, despite accounting for just 17% of world population. Instead of being the breadbasket of the world today, our continent remains a basket case in many spheres. As Africa seeks homegrown solutions to its numerous challenges, foreign relations experts in Nigeria have launched the Academy of International Affairs, expected to serve as a think tank to help Nigeria navigate through the complex waters of international relations. This academy is emerging at a period of its greatest need. The international environment is becoming increasingly more complex and more demanding of our best intellects, professionalism, commitments and visions. We don't want to be continuously pulled back to negotiating um, 20th century ag agreements that are mercantilistic in approach. So this should be the outlook and that is why we need the academy also to help prepare us uh, for such engagements. In setting up this academy, we are not only doing Nigeria a favor, we are doing ourselves a favor. And I hope that in our activities, this mutual favor will manifest itself, not in antagonism, but in cooperation. This platform promises to be a crucible for insightful policy making in Nigeria and indeed 
Africa at large. With some of the best minds as members of the academy, its policy outputs will certainly be priceless. Nigeria's former president, Yakubu Gowon, urged members of the academy to collaborate with the current government to help reposition Nigeria among the Committee of Nations. In Abuja for News Central, I am Amadine Uyi. Aimed at, in a move aimed at increasing youth and women's participation in government, the Federal Executive Council has approved a new policy. This initiative will reserve 10% of all government appointments for young people with an emphasis on equitable representation for young women. The announcement was made by Dr. Jamila Ibrahim, Minister of Youth, following the fourth FEC meeting in Abuja. The minister expressed hope that this quarter will encourage young Nigerians to become more involved in decision-making processes and civic engagement. The meeting also addressed several other key issues, such as infrastructure development, as the council approved the creation of a new Renewed Hope Infrastructure Fund. We have received council's approval to institutionalize a 30% youth quota a 30% representation of young people in all government appointments and an equitable young women representation inclusive of this 30%. Well, this will go a long way to address the long marginalization and exclusion of young people in decision making and um, will also go a long way to encourage young people to participate in decision-making processes, and in civic engagements. This will in turn lead to um, young people contributing tremendously to national development agenda. Then I'm also pleased to announce the second council approval um, to restructure and institutionalize the Nigerian Youth Investment Fund. This is a fund that was approved in 2020 and um, on assumption of office, of this administration, we commissioned a technical committee to review this fund and restructure it with the aim of institutionalizing it through a legal framework. We have secured council approval for the immediate release of the 25 billion from the 2023 Supplementary Appropriation Act and an additional 25 billion from the 2024 Appropriation Act. Coming up, Zuma's party supporters celebrate as court rules it can contest 2024 election. We have details after the break. Join us again. Thank you for staying with us. The news continues in West Africa, where Basiru Diomaye Faye, in his first public appearance since securing the presidency, has expressed his first commitment to stirring Senegal in a new direction. Faye emphasized that his election victory symbolized a decisive break from the existing political order, signaling a desire for change among the Senegalese people. Addressing concerns about international relations, Faye reassured foreign partners that Senegal would remain a steadfast and trustworthy ally for nations seeking constructive and respectful collaboration. He pledged to foster virtues and mutually beneficial partnerships while upholding Senegal's interests on the global stage. In a cautionary gesture, Faye spoke of his intention to mend divides with Senegalese society, emphasizing the need to unite hearts and minds for the nation's collective well-being. He promised to, dilig to, dil to diligently work towards fulfilling the aspirations kindled by his election, striving to translate promises into tangible progress for the Senegal populace. This election is intervened in a context marked by a crisis pre-electoral that will cost lives qui aura fait de nombreux blessés, qui aura vu de nombreux patriotes emprisonnés. Nous entendons tourner cette page pour réconcilier les cœurs, réconcilier les Sénégalais, 
et nous mettre inlassablement au travail qui devra mar marquer et réaliser l'espoir qui a été suscité par mon élection et le projet dont je suis le porteur. Au vu des urgences qui étreignent et de l'espérance placée en nous, nous travaillerons de manière acharnée et méthodique autour des chantiers prioritaires dont les plus importants à nos yeux sont la réconciliation nationale et la reconstruction des bases de notre vivre ensemble, la refondation des institutions, l'allègement sensible du coût de la vie, les concertations nationales inclusives, sectorielles sur l'évaluation et la relance des politiques publiques. Je voudrais dire à la communauté internationale, à nos partenaires bilatéraux et multilatéraux, que le Sénégal tiendra toujours son rang. Il restera le pays ami et l'allié sûr et fiable de tout partenaire qui s'engagera avec nous dans une coopération vertueuse, respectueuse et mutuellement productive. In Southern Africa, hundreds of supporters of the South African opposition Konto Zizwe MK Party, which is backed by scandal-tainted ex-president Jacob Zuma, celebrates on the streets in Johannesburg after an electoral court in the city ruled that the party can stand in the May 29 general election. The court rejected the complaint by the ruling African National Congress, ANC, Zuma's former party, which said MK's name and symbol were so similar to those of the now disbanded military wing of ANC that these could deceive or confuse voters. Well, I think this is a victory not only from the MK, but this is a victory for South Africa because justice has prevailed and we are going ahead to May 29 for our two thirds majority. Fortune Charumbira has been re elected Pan African Parliament president. This comes after a South African court on Thursday dismissed an application by the Botswana legislature which sought to stop the extraordinary meeting. Charumbira was contesting against Samfa, the Wea Mouse of Zambia. The election follows after the Executive Council decisions of the African Union Summit held in February 2024. The ministerial session was worried about the situation at the Pan African Parliament and called for urgent convening of the extraordinary session to fill the vacant positions. New Centrist Bongani Shiziba has details. In a stunning turn of events, Chief Fortune Charumbira has been re elected as the president of Pan African Parliament after a long adjournment shrouded in controversy. In his address as the newly elected leader of the organization, he rolls out his agenda clearly that the Pan African Parliament is charting a new course. Pop itself should conduct itself in a manner that will build confidence in the public, in the citizens of this continent. I'm president of Pop, but certainly if you ask me, no, 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 Pop has not quite conducted itself in order to build confidence in the public. So this bureau, that's what item number one, beginning this week. What is it that we should correct about the image of Pan-African Parliament? The organization has been criticized for inaction and lack of progress that plagued in the past. But with the fresh leadership and renewed focus, many are hoping for a brighter future. Sharumbira emphasized the need for unity within the organization and called for silencing of the guns in Africa to bring about lasting peace and stability on the continent. The Pan-African Parliament, in one of, one of its mandates, or go functions, is to ensure that there is democracy on the continent and a culture of democracy. And democracy only exists if we do not have military coups. 
But this is a subject that our committee, we have a committee which is specific on that subject, whose portfolio is to look at uh, the issues of conflict on the continent. It has been all over the continent, Sudan, Darfur, uh, DRC, uh, West African countries. We've done very well. We would want to rejuvenate that, those activities. Speaking on the sidelines of the meeting, the newly elected second vice president said she's committed to working towards elevating women and addressing the issues that affect them. She is going to represent the woman voice in the pub, and there is now there is two uh, women, the the fourth vice, the third vice president, the best vice president, and they then contribute a lot to the Pan African Parliament. Pan African Parliament has been known for in-house fights disputes over positions and accusations of financial mismanagement. Critics have pointed out the organization's perceived indifference towards African issues. The question that looms large is, can the Pan-African Parliament president and his team reclaim its former glory and once again serve as a unifying force for Africa? In Midrand at Pan-African Parliament, for News Central, Wongani Sisiba. In East Africa, a long wait for justice is nearing its end for families devastated by the horrific Shakahola Forest massacre last year as Kenyan authorities are set to release the first identified remains of victims linked to a doomsday cult on Tuesday. Following the painstaking year of DNA analysis, authorities have finally identified a number of the 429 exhumed bodies. This marked a turning point in a case that shocked the nation. Hundreds perished including children after being convinced by court leader Paul and Thangir Mackenzie to starve themselves in a twisted bead to meet Jesus. While starvation claimed many lives, autopsies revealed signs of violence in some victims, raising further questions about the cult's activities. In Central Africa, Chad is in mourning after a deadly mine blast claimed the lives of seven soldiers. The incident occurred on Monday in the Valatao Lake Chad region, a known hotspot for jihadist activity. President Matmat Idris Debni Ito confirmed the tragic news, stating that the soldier's vehicle struck the mine while conducting a routine patrol near the Chuktu Telia. The Lake Chad region has long been a battleground for Chadian forces and extremist groups like Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa province. While Chad has seen success against those groups in recent years, this attack serves as a grim reminder of the ongoing threat. This tragedy comes just weeks before Chad's presidential election on the 6th of May. The trial for the brutal killing of Cameroonian journalist Martinez Zogo, which began on Monday, has been postponed until 15th of April. Zogo, known for his anti-corruption reporting, was abducted last year and his body was found days later. The case has garnered international attention and sparked outrage in Cameroon, a country with a long history of press restrictions. 17 individuals stand accused, including the former intelligence chief and members of a military commando unit. The wealthy businessman, John Perry Amogu Belinga, with alleged ties to government officials, is also among the defendants. All are charged with involvement in Zogo's kidnapping, torture, and murder. This, uh, today, in this uh, trial, the first day of the trial, we saw that the, um, the lawyer uh, of the, the people who are accused in this procedure, they are not want to really discuss about the real facts. So, I think that Nous allons, euh, nous allons suivre les débats, nous allons y participer. Pour l'instant, nous n'avons pas d'inquiétude parce que euh, jusqu'à présent, le président nous a quand même laissé dire ce que nous voulions dire. Euh, parfois, vous avez des procès où on essaye euh, d'empêcher. A major bridge in the U.S. city of Baltimore has entirely collapsed into the Patapsco River 
after being hit by a container ship. Video shows the bridge breaking up and quickly plunging into the water along with vehicles and people. Aerial shots of the scene shows the ship wedged into the debris from the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which is 1.6 miles long and packed off a major highway. According to authorities, rescuers are searching for at least seven people, while two others have been pulled from the water. The port of Baltimore near the bridge is the largest in the U.S. for specialized cargo. And joining me on the news to give the more, uh, a bit of context to this story is our international correspondent, Hafia Hagan. Hafia, what's the latest on this bridge crash? Well, this terrible incident that has occurred uh, in Baltimore, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, as you mentioned there, uh, rescuers are now looking for six people and two people have been pulled from the water. So they have used sonar to figure out the fact that there is vehicles in the water and those vehicles potentially belong to construction crew who were on the bridge at the time. Now, the bridge had no major defects but it was, the road on the bridge was being repaired for potholes. That's why you had construction crew that were on the bridge at that time. So like I said, um, over the pre few press conferences we've had <laughs> this morning. Afia, can you still hear me? So yes, yeah, six people have been pulled Excuse me, six are being looked for at the moment, and two Afia, people have been Do you pulled. need a moment? Yes, please. The <clears throat> city fire chief has said that around 1.30 local May Day, and the May Day enabled <clears throat> the bridge to be closed from both sides and that inevitably saved hundreds possibly thousands of lives and stopped people from crossing that bridge and now the mayor of baltimore brandon scott has also described this incident as an unthinkable tragedy and they're investigating now whether there might be an oil spill into the river they also want to make it absolutely clear that there is no indication that this is terrorism or terrorism related in any way. Hmm. Now, the ship that you see there has operate, is operated by Maersk and Maersk are a Danish shipping com company. They've released a statement saying that their thoughts and prayers are with the people of Baltimore at that time. And now, the two people that were driving the boat, the pilots, is, as the, if it were, the sailors, um, <clears throat> were very experienced. And so there's no reason why they would crash into the bridge in this way. So it's thought that potentially there was a malfunction on this particular shipping container. Like I said, the crew on the ship were very experienced and none of the crew on the ship have been hurt in any way, shape or form. Uh, the the uh, victims, as it were, is still a search and rescue operation at the moment, but the victims, as it were, will come from the construction crew that were on the bridge repairing the potholes at the moment. Mm. Well, well, finally, Afia, the port of Baltimore, which is near the bridge, is the largest <coughs> in the U.S. for specialized cargo. How will this collapse affect shipping? Well, you're absolutely right in saying this is, you know, a big area for shipping. Baltimore is a huge um, port states as it were in america uh, 800,000 vehicles passed through it in two, 2023 moving about 1.3 million tons of import, imported cargo uh, and when there is a major disaster like this and this is a major disaster that will create significant problems on the east coast for importers or exporters and so you will have something like 21,000 units of cargo having to go through other ports in the region that could just over the next week alone so there's going to be a big issue for shipping and cargo in that region. There will be delays and there will be additional costs as well. But on top of that, this particular bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge, is a major road <clears throat> in that area, um, going to Washington and other states around. And at the moment, obviously, drivers are having to circumnavigate the fact that there is no bridge there anymore. So you're going to have major, major delays on transport and for people driving in that area as well. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for bringing, uh, bringing context to the story. Afia Hagen, our international correspondent, thank you once again.
The federal government has initiated international efforts to apprehend Nadem and Jawala, a key executive of Binance who escaped custody on Friday. And Jawala, a suspect in the probe into Binance activities in Nigeria, reportedly fled using the Kenyan passport, evading security measures in place. Security agencies were left stunned by the escape, especially considering Anjawala was held in a secure location guarded by soldiers. Zakari Minjinwaya, head of strategic communication at the office of the National Security Advisor, underscored ongoing efforts to apprehend the fugitive and investigate the circumstances surrounding his escape. He noted that those responsible for his custody have been detained pending further investigation. The unbeaten streak of Shooting Star Sports Club of Ibadan came to a halt last night as they suffered a one to defeat against Niger Tornadoes of Mina. The Ibadan team, who had been leading by one goal, ultimately lost to Econ Alla Boys, considering a late winner during the March 27th fixture at the Amadou Bello Stadium in Kaduna. Christian Piagbara, in a good form, scored for the visitors in the 39th minute, giving them a first half lead. However, the home team equalized in the 76th minute through Clinton Jaffet. The dramatic turn substitute Ikenna Offer secured the victory for Tornadoes with a goal in the fourth minute of the added time. With 40 points and currently in the eighth place on the league table, Shooting Stars will face Quara United of Ilori in their next match day 28 encounter at home next week. The African governing body, CAF, has allowed participating teams to sign up new players before the quarterfinal of the CAF Confederation Cup. Rivers United among the clubs set to compete in the quarterfinal match this weekend across the continent, ending the spot in the final eight with a 2-1 victory over Dream FC of Ghana in Uyo on the final day. CAF states that clubs should register new players or replace those who have left the club. The Pride of Rivers will welcome UC. UCM Algiers in the first leg of the competition, followed by reverse fixture in Algiers a week later. Nottingham Forest took action by appealing the four points deduction imposed on them for violating Premier League financial regulations on Monday. The club officially announced their appeal today, stating their objection to the sanction handed down by the Commission due to their breach of the Premier League's profit and sustainability rules. On 18th of March, the Premier League club acknowledged their breach of the profitability and sustainability rules, surpassing the 61 million euro threshold by 34.5 million euros. Nottingham Forest became the second top flight team this season to face penalties for PSR violations following Everton's 10 point deduction in November, later reduced to six points on appeal. German club Bayer Leverkusen welcomed back Nigerian forward Victor Boniface to full training after he had been sidelined for approximately three months due to an abduction injury on Monday. The 23-year-old sustained this injury during Nigeria's preparations for the 2023 Africa Cup of Nations, causing him to miss out on the competition. Boniface, who is Bayer Leverkusen's leading scorer this season with 16 goals, and eight assists in 23 games across all competitions was seen training with his teammate. His return to action comes as a timely boost for Der Wexelk, who remain unbeaten in all competitions this season. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, let's take a look again at some of the major stories. Nigeria's president, Tinobu, to attend burial for slain soldiers in Delta State. Jacob Zuma's party supporters have celebrated as Scott rules it can contest South Africa election. We also told you that Kenyan authorities have begun handover of victims to families of Paul's massacre. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen and follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 42. Star Times, Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Adebola Adeduga.